friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. Hi, and I'm Maria Nakagam. And we are going to talk to you about AI today. We're going to talk about .NET and how AI and .NET are the match made in heaven. We're going to do some really cool stuff. We're going to augment applications, take them from modern apps to intelligent apps, right, Maria? Yes, and most importantly, we're going to make sure that you feel like you can do it too. I love that. I want to feel powerful. I want to be able to make my applications even cooler. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to give you a little bit of context about how we're thinking about AI. And then uh, when I'm done with that, we'll bring Maria back and we'll get into some real demos. Can't wait. All right, let's go. I'm going to bring up my screen over here. And I want to call out that uh, in, in, in GitHub here, there's lots of ways to interact with Copilot. I'm using Visual Studio Code. I could be using Visual Studio for Windows. I could be using GitHub on the web. It's all that same Copilot on the back end. Now, we see lots and lots of demos where someone will go and type something and generate a bunch of code. And that's a, that's a perfectly fine demo. And that's a great, powerful feature in GitHub Copilot. But one of the things that I think isn't talked about enough is... Uh, using it as a pair programmer, kind of as a rubber duck. Uh, a rubber duck programming model is the kind where you put a duck, a rubber duck, this is my Borg Microsoft rubber duck, and I just put him on my, on my monitor here. And if I have questions, I'll just talk to the duck and I'll say, hey, I'm stuck on this programming problem. Now, the, the issue is that the duck doesn't talk back but GitHub Copilot can. It is an infinitely patient, friendly pair programmer unlike my duck, which is very quiet, that will brainstorm with me. So I can go in here and I could click uh, start voice chat down in the corner because I've got some mobility challenges right now in my hands. So accessibility is baked in as well. I'm going to say voice chat. I could also type. What do you think about this code? Are there any opportunities to make it more secure? And this is really great here. I want to pause and back up for a second and call out used one reference. It's actually indicating that it knows which part of the code we're talking about. It's not looking at the entire code base. It's referencing a, a section of that code base. I can select that code and say, hey, Copilot, explain this, fix this, uh, review it. Perhaps you want to generate docs, generate tests. But I want to understand from my pair programmer here, what it thinks I could do to make some improvements. So I'm going to say, what do you think about this code? And it says, yeah, there's a couple opportunities here. You can parameterize the URL because I'm you know, not building that URL in a thoughtful way. I am not, in fact, catching all of my exception handlings. And I could be checking out things like SSL. And then it offers some revisions, some actual thoughtful revisions about how I could change that code. And if I didn't want this information, if I wanted to have a different information, I could be more specific. I could say, select this and say, explain this chunk of code, for example. I'm providing less context and it's getting deeper. I'm only giving it lines 60 through 66. And then this is cool. It can actually offer a follow-up question, which was something I was actually gonna ask it anyway. What does the await keyword do? I can just click on that and GitHub Copilot's gonna give me uh, a follow-up. So I'll have big, long conversations, brainstorming with my uh, GitHub Copilot. I think about it as this kind of friendly junior engineer that can just sit there and help me better understand my code. And it's patient, it's infinitely patient. It'll sit there and talk to me as long as, uh, as possible. Now, my application is modern, but it is not intelligent. So I want to bring Maria in from the .NET AI team to share what the .NET team has been doing in this space. And maybe I can make my application and other applications a lot more intelligent. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So I'm going to share my screen for a bit. I wanted to start with what we are committed to in the .NET team when moving from one tech wave to another. .NET has been there through every single major shift that we have had in the past 20 years. We were there with you for mobile, we were there for you for cloud native, we were there for you cross platform, and now we are here for you in AI. And our goal here is to make it as easy and as simple as possible for you to leverage AI into your application. Now we understand the AI ecosystem is incredibly vast. Like you've probably seen how vast it is, Scott. 
Absolutely. There's a ton of players, a ton of code words and three-letter acronyms that I'm still learning to this day. And I'm hoping during this keynote, we can guide people through this journey on how we are making AI more approachable for you. So when we thought about our investments in AI, we wanted to make sure that it resonated with where developers were going to learn how they were building their application, as well as making sure that when we were going into the AI ecosystem, we were showing up in places where .NET developers were learning about AI. We wanted to ensure that you were able to deploy these applications easily. And most importantly, you want to be able to monitor them in production to make sure that your customers and your developer experiences and your engineers know what's happening to their application. On the learn side, we set out to build a bunch of samples. This was a great ex experience for us as a team because it put us in our developers' shoes. We were learning as they were learning. So as we were building these samples, it allowed us to start identifying core building blocks that we needed to enable in .NET so that you could compose these AI components, whether they were first party or third party. In the .NET side, we made investments in core AI building blocks such as tokenizers and tensors so that we would enable to build things like vector stores with other teams. We work very closely with the semantic kernel team that sits right here at the Octo at Microsoft. The semantic kernel enables developers to easily attach to the AI ecosystem. In the AI ecosystem, we wanted to make sure that we were working with places like OpenAI and at Build, we announced the c -sharp OpenAI client. We also work with vector stores such as Quadrant and Milvis to build a first-class C-Sharp experience. And currently, we're working with Pinecone to build a C-Sharp experience as well. We also enable in the deploy scenario to meet developers in exciting new places like .NET Aspire for developers to be able to easily integrate with Azure AI, as well as easily deploy with, Azure, with AZD. And finally, because of Aspire, and Azure Monitor, you can now monitor your applications in production. So before I go into demo, I'd like to bring Scott back. So Scott, do you know what RAG is? I hear the term RAG a lot. I know the R is retrieval, but I'm still learning my, my TLAs, my three-letter acronyms. OK. So RAG is a technique which stands for retrieval, augmentation, and generation. So before I show you the chatbot, let's go through a tiny scenario. So you know me, I like my comics, I like to draw. So I came up with a comic book story. So Scott, imagine you were a customer agent and you were presented with a ticket of a customer complaint. How would you go about figuring that out? Uh, it all comes down to context. I want to understand the problem. I want to find them a solution, but I want to understand, mm -hmm. have they talked to us before? Or do I know anything about them? I would want to explore this problem space. And this is where something like RAG will happen. So I'm going to explain RAG in three steps. Let's start with retrieval. So if I was a customer support agent, as you mentioned, you'd like to know context of where this was happening before. If you were working in an office today, you'd probably have to look over to your boss or look over to somebody else and ask them for advice. Or you'd have to read through a bunch of documentation. Now, in this scenario, the customer, who in this case is a customer support agent, could ask a bot a question. This question is then passed on to a smart retriever, and this is called the retrieval section. In the retrieval section, we take that question and then we look up based on domain knowledge. In this case, that would be the customer support tickets. Now, based on things like semantic relevance and cosine similarity, what the AI will do is retrieve relevant documents. Now, that's phase one. Am I, are you with me so far? Yeah, I think the part that really clicked for me just a second there is that we're not trying to think that a very large language model knows everything. It doesn't know everything about all knowledge in the world. It's a text-based generator. It knows a lot about some stuff, but it doesn't know about my domain, about my customers, about the issues. So it's that domain knowledge that clicked for me. You're augmenting the large language model with specific domain knowledge. And I assume that comes from 
anywhere. You decide. You, the developer, gets to decide where that domain knowledge comes from. Yes. And in AI, you'll, you'll hear about things like grounding. This allows us to ground the data specific to our scenario. Now, you jumped ahead. Like, this just goes how far you, you are in this journey, Scott. You jumped to augmentation. Ah, okay. So, I didn't realize. Which is good, which means everybody else as a .NET developer will begin to connect the dots too. Excellent. So the next thing with augmentation is we have the data. So it knows maybe you've asked about a water bottle, right? So it's looking for everything relevant to a water bottle. Now it's going to pair the water bottle with your original question, and it's going to use the LLM to further analyze this data. This makes sure that it probably does additional relevancy checks because mm. some of the data that might have been pulled could have been every single water bottle, not the H2O water bottle. So the LLM comes into place yet again with a model in order to do that for you. Okay. So this is that grounding. I don't want it to talk about other things the customer may have bought. I don't want to talk about the entire product catalog. We're slowly narrowing the problem space down, given context, given domain knowledge. Yeah, exactly. That, that's reducing things like hallucinations. Right. The, the, I don't like to use that term, hallucinations. And I love that you said grounded because you're, in, you're kind of showing you can fabricate, you can generate, yeah. you can see these models kind of float away like a balloon. But I love that you said you want to ground it in the domain knowledge and that way it stays on task. Yes. So you want truth versus hopeful truth. That's a great, I love that analogy. Thank you for that. So the next one is like, okay, we have our question, we have our response, we have to generate a response. And the response has to come back in a format that makes sense to the customer support agent. And this is when natural language comes back, comes to play. And then it is sent right back. I dig it. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Okay. So I'm going to switch screens and I'm going to show you RAG in code. Ooh, demos, live demos. Oh yeah, I haven't been, I haven't demoed in a while, so please show me some patience. No, I've absolutely, I'm excited. Okay, so we are in VS Code, and I am going to show you the RAG loop, simply in code. Like we're not going to get into details on ingesting and chalking and storing the data. There are so many presentations throughout the day that will show you how to do that, but I would like to show you the RAG loop. The RAG loop, the first one is retrieval, where you are doing a search for the results against a set of documents. We're going to look at the ticket, the product ID, the value, as well as the query. The query in this case is the question, but this could also need something as simple as summarization as well. We're then going to pair the query in the augmentation section, where we're going to start using the LLM to start even creating, narrowing down our context. And finally, we are then going to generate the responses and give them back to the user. So let's run this application. So Scott, I'm gonna show you this with AI and without AI, so you begin to notice the value of adding AI into your application. You ready? Ready, because we're gonna see a modern application become an intelligent application. I like it. So. I don't want to be too fussy. I'm going to keep it simple. We're going to stick to the console first. Okay. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run this app. So I already ingested the data before because the ingestion section process can take a while. And okay. we want to make sure that people don't get hung up on that. So I've already ingested the data. I am inspecting the ticket. And I'm just going to pick on one of them. Let's look at the filter cartridge. Now, if you look at this, it's a customer agent interaction. This means, this is a pretty good system, but that means I have to read through this. And if you're dyslexic like me, it can take a while. To be clear though, I wanna make sure I understand. So what we're looking at is an actual transcript of real humans talking to each other. Exactly. This is not AI. These are a transcript of a chat between a customer and an agent with a question. And to your point, to absorb this, for anyone is, is a lot. There's a lot here. Dyslexic or not, I'm, I'm still 
kind of my eyes are blurred as I'm ready to like, uh, it's like when you get on hold and they say, hang on, and they go and they have to read and catch up. That's going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time. So how do we help people through that process? Let's summarize the information so people have context, which will enable greater customer satisfaction. So I'm going to go back to my code. I'm going to do a little bitty trick. As you can see, I'm a first class typist, you know, commenting and uncommenting lights, like lines. And we're going to restart this application. And right here, I have added AI to do the summary. So what we should see is a summarization of this conversation. <laughs> What did you do? Click on again. Okay. Cool. And you're doing this as a developer, so you're seeing the <laughs> compilation and the running and the starting up process takes a little bit of a time here because you you've changed code, recompiled it, and are running it again. Exactly. And if you are doing this in a real app, have you ever used AI where you see the dot dots happening? Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of like UI elements that we can give to, to customers so they know that something's happening in the background. Absolutely. So when it hit inspect, we're going to pick the exact same entry. And right now, we have a summary right on top. See, that's, that's a nice, that's a delighter. I think of that as a customer delighter, you know. Uh, I'm thinking of our friends at... Uh, uh, at the story graph that have like a, um, a book reading reviewer site. And it's like, there's a thousand reviews of a book. Give me a little thing at the top that says, Hey, what's a summary. So you've made it so I can read a sentence and choose if I want to read the entire multiple paragraphs. Exactly. That's going to make scanning that a lot more easy. A lot easier. Here we have only a few thousand entries, but you can imagine if people had millions over years, over different data stores. How effective would that make them? Yeah, and you could you could say uh, from a user interface perspective, you might say AI generated summary, and that gets to that responsible AI perspective where a customer service agent who is in their application experiencing this for the first time would say, "Oh, okay, I see that that part in the yellow at the top is an AI generated summary, and I see that the bottom was real humans talking, and that makes it really clear uh, what's going on here, which is super cool." Yeah, our, like our whole thing is not to remove the personal touch that people get when interacting with a real human. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like it. All right. So how can we do an AI demo without chat? You know, I appreciate that because chatbots are kind of the easy thing to do. And it's nice and refreshing to see just little delightful moments of AI that are taking my application plus one, plus plus as opposed to the chatbot, all the things. No, nope. chatbot only when needed is yeah. my problem. But I'm gonna show you a chatbot anyway. Uh, that's okay, because the important thing there is to show the ability to do anything in .NET, whether it be a chatbot or a delightful uh, improvement in an application here. Okay. All right, so the last secret source. We are going to enable chat. And there we have it. Dot net run one more time. We inspect it. We enter. Now we have a summary plus the conversation. Yeah. I want to begin a chat and we're like, okay, so this is about a filtration system. So I could ask a question, how many times should any fingers the filter? And it gives me a summary that I can go read and I can personalize on my own to help the customer through their issue. Oh, interesting. So the chatbot in this context, and maybe I'm understanding this correctly, is the agent is getting a way to search using RAG through all of the different facts and documentation so that they could still make a, uh, make a recommendation to the user. So you could make this chatbot for the back end, for the support person, what? or for the front end for the customer. It's up to you. 
it's up to you. And in this case, what I also wanted, like you caught on to something. We're looking, think about domain knowledge. It's not enough just to know about what the format issues were. You also need to know where the manuals to the products that you are referencing, because the two of them provide you with a customer solution. And the beauty of AI, and especially when it comes to data ingestion, is the format of the data shouldn't matter. We should be able, whether it's a text or whether it is a PDF or whether it is an image or whether it is anything, as long as these all come together to form context, we should provide a meaningful experience oh. for our users. So you caught something on it. Like, I was looking at this data. We were looking at the agent interaction. But then you just asked about something specific to the product. And how did you get them both to work together? And that's what data ingestion does. Oh, I see. So it's it, that, that ingestion thing is important. That data might be the product catalog. It might be JSON files. It might be PDFs. It might be markdown. It may be all of the above. And that's that important step. Exactly. And going back to grounded versus ungrounded results. Okay. Very cool. I dig it. And, and th will this code be available? Like this seems like something I'm going to want to put on my site. Oh, it will be available. So if you go to .NET, a .NET AI samples, we'll have links at the end of our keynote, this will be available. So you can use it as soon as you watch this video. Okay, so maybe I'm putting you on the spot here. I love a, I love a good console app and I wanna give you credit for having a colorful console app because you had Interact, you know, you're using Spectre console, it's beautiful, it's multiple colors and stuff like that. Do you have anything uh, that shows me rag, maybe a little more towards a web application, like like my web application. Oh, Scott, let me just show you something I read earlier. Like we're doing all cooking shows. We've done <laughs> all the technical challenge. Now we're doing the showstopper. I love it. I love it. So you are familiar with eShop. Correct. Yes. Yes. Eshop is one of our big samples. Sample applications historically have been uh, kind of simplistic. Like the Northwind sample is like products. Eshop is a fully formed, very fleshed out, sophisticated sample that shows you how to do container orchestration, microservices, really big, sophisticated applications. It's quite a extensive sample. It is. But I have a new version of Eshop. Can you guess what it is? I suspect that you've added AI and RAG to make it even more fabulous. I have, but I also wanted to focus on core scenarios. Going back to the chatbot conversation, like everything in November, we showed eShop with a chatbot where you could ask what products were available. That's great. But when we saw, when we did research, we found that customers, developers, everyone in the industry really wanted AI to help them with the mundane, tedious talk tasks, such as summarization, translation, um, sentiment analysis, right? You want you to guess how your consumers were feeling about the experience. So I am going to show you the beautiful version of the console application. I love it. The Maria-ified version the Maria of the Maria here. Exactly. <laughs> Very demanding. Right. Let's so, see it. We're going to start from a customer scenario. So let's say I'm a customer, right? And I am opening up a new support ticket. So I'm going to start a new request. Is it about a specific product? Yes, it is. Now, how many times have you tried to fill in like a customer support request? And you have to either go back to your email or go back to like your outbox and figure out your inbox of uh, Amazon or another product and try to figure out what the name of the product was. Yeah, I mean, they're not very sophisticated, right? Oftentimes the support ticket page is just a bunch of text boxes that are not clever text boxes. And I just end up typing into them and I presume that it generates some email on the back end. It's not a smart box. No, it isn't. So I'm going to show you something. I'm just going to start typing, okay? What do you see? Uh, so it's auto-completed, but you, you typed in bottle and it found bottles. Cool. It found bottles. Now, it only found bottles that AdventureWorks sells. 
And we did this with something called smart components. So smart components is like a UI AI element that we experimented with on the .NET team. So Steve Standard said, built this together, said, how would developers, how would consumers actually benefit from AI inside of their UI? So this is the experience of it. Customer didn't have to go back and forth. They didn't have to copy and paste. They're like, oh, I remember buying an Aquaflow 750 million meter water body. Mm -hmm. So you can do that. Right. And if I understand correctly, you could be even more vague. That's not just a search autocomplete box. You could say H2O. You could misspell bottle. You could say, uh, you know, the, the liquid holder thing. And it would figure out that it was one of those water bottles. It would. Now, that's the beauty of like, adding smartness to your application, yeah. intelligence to it. So I'm going to just write something pretty vague, which is like my bottle, my bottle is leaking exclamation mark. I am happy, <laughs> right? And I can submit it. And there we go. As you can see, I'm a frequent complainer. Yeah, apparently yeah. this is a real problem for that. You need tech problem. support for a bottle, but I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go and look at what the customer support agent would see. Gotcha. So we're going to look at this. Now, let me zoom in a little because I want you to feel the magic of this. Okay. So we have Alice. So Alice is a frequent complainer. That is me. But what you will notice is it gives it a sentiment analysis. Oh, see, I love a good emoji. I appreciate <laughs> Me too, right? It gives like a sentiment analysis of like, hey, Alice has been here before and this time she is not happy. And it also gives a satisfaction rate, which means I can either not answer it. So even from a person who is using this app for the first time, they know which ones to address first. And one of the most important cases, simply by a class. This is great. I love that, that, you know, I picked on you a little bit when you showed me the chat bot, but what I'm seeing are delightful little improvements that are making apps more pleasant, more helpful, more accessible, easier to explore, easier to absorb. In the, the, it's the toil. We've talked about this. Like, oh, you're a tech support person. They're, they've come with a complaint. Here, read two pages of text. Or you're a tech support person. You've got a crushing list of 349 open tickets. Find the ones that are the most mad. Yep. You've solved those problems with, with yep. code, with .NET. Back it. All, and this is all .NET. This is Blazor. This is full stack. There is no magic here. It is just .NET. And this code will be available as well for everyone to use. And Steve Sanderson will go into more details on how we built this. Like, I, I think you can sense this is a Steve Sanderson application. Yeah, the team is doing a great job. Steve is a great communicator. We're seeing a lot of really, really cool uh, sample code being created that's very actionable. I could imagine going and putting RAG on my podcast site, which is written in .NET, having people ask questions about the last 400 hours of content. Hey, I was looking for that episode where Maria was on the show talking about AI. She said something, something, something. Can you find that? That would be a cool feature I could add to my podcast. I would, I would install the Hassel Minute AI podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, we should build that for .NET night. We should do that. Let's get on that. Okay, so I am not willing to deal with Alice right now. So let's see if Sarah's a little bit happier. So mm -hmm. I'm going to click on that. Now, back to this. What you note of the zoom up, this is a bit too big because you have not seen the magic. Remember the summary? We see the summary up here as well. Nice. We also have a real life conversation history between Sarah and the previous agent. So if I am the new agent who's on shift right now, I have access to this information and I have a summary of what happened for me. So that is cool. That is really cool. Pretty cool. So I can ask questions like Sarah, like Sarah's had an issue. She wants a refund, right? Because it's been a lot of our replacement. So why don't I ask AI if we can issue a refund? 
can be issue Sarah. I All right, so I think we can zoom in a little bit on that again, go back to the larger fonts. And so the system has gone and searched for refund policy, probably through a bunch of manuals and a bunch of knowledge bases. And it's it's providing back-end help for uh, an assistant, which would allow that person to be uh, up to speed faster. It would make it more fun to, to, to do their job and it would make it less stressful. Exactly. But this is what I think is also really important. Talking about grounding, we also want to be at F being ethical. We might also show you where that information is from. So you can mm. see a little reference here. You probably also noticed it when you use Bing, for example. Yeah, that's a great point. If I'm focused on asking it a question about specific things, I don't want to go and suddenly start talking to my customer support chatbot about, you know, Elden Ring or whatever. And it would say, oh, I'm not a video game chatbot. I'm a customer support chatbot. I want it grounded in the situation, which is, this knowledge base article and th those things that are important to my job. I don't want to chat about random stuff. So I need to keep it on topic. Exactly. And what I love about this is that, look, it highlights exactly where it's from. So you don't even need to read the template. Oh, wow. Okay. Hang on. That's great. So it's referenced it just like we saw in GitHub Copilot, where it said, here's the lines of code that I'm looking at. This is the section that is my context. And it highlighted it. This is telling you not just the doc that it found it at, but it, highlighted the line that it's wow. referencing. That is grounded. I dig it. That is very grounded. So you could use this for a couple of things. You could, one, ask AI to respond. But as a person, you probably want to add your own flavor. So I always advise people, yes, you can ask the assistant to make sure that you're responding with the right information, but you could also just respond yourself. And mm. that is what I have for you today, Scott. This is really cool. I love it. This is giving us a real sense of what can be done and how we can uh, you know, take an application, spice it up a little bit, sprinkle, sprinkle a little uh, AI into it. Very demure, very mindful, very okay. thoughtful. I dig it. Thank you so much, Maria, for uh, spending time with us today. This has been a pretty cool keynote. I feel good about this. Me too. It's uh, been my first time doing a talk in a while, and I'm glad I got to do it with you. Absolutely smashed it. Shoulders back. Be proud of ourselves. We've made it. We've got a great day filled with content for you. I feel really good about this keynote, and I know that the other talks that we're going to get to learn from today are going to be even better. Uh, we're going to bring experts from all across the .NET organization to teach you how to make AI impactful, responsible, thoughtful, and make your applications not just modern, but intelligent. Thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you.